Well, it's great to be here, Kim. It's a pleasure to see you, to meet you remotely. Um, thanks for doing this. Um, you know, when we were talking a couple weeks ago about prepping for the panel, what came out in our conversation was how there's a big distinction between the old world of uh, tech, of IPO, of SPACs, of capital markets, of M&A, and then the new world. So I think, Kim, just starting off the conference, it'd be just great to get your perspective on what is that? What's the old and new world right now? Alex, first of all, thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be here. I hope everyone's safe and healthy and enjoying the start to the summer. You know, what a, what a great topic, old versus new in the context of deal making. You know, I, I would say in this new world, the pace of innovation has never been greater, yet I, I really believe it'll never be this slow again. And that frames how how I think about all these themes across tech and media convergence, around capital markets innovation, around technology evolution. So, so I'm happy to, to have this conversation with you. Really excited about it. So to, to that point, well, you know, what do clients, what do investors, what do they want to see today? What are they digging into now versus, say, pre-COVID? So first off, the, the scale and impact of tech companies has never been greater. We're seeing technology and innovation disrupt industries across the world, and companies are using innovation to create value. And so what do investors want to invest in? They are they want to invest in companies that are fundamentally changing the way we work and live, that uh, companies that have differentiated technologies, product, content, companies that have wide-scale user adoption uh, and unit economics that support that, market leaders with large global addressable markets um, with deep competitive moats. And, and something that's not new is that investors are looking for long-term durable growth. They're looking for profitability and they're looking for cash flow. And, and to answer your question on, on COVID, you know, that's obviously the major difference over the past, you know, one and a half, two years. And COVID has accelerated some business. It's battle-tested others who are emerging stronger. But I view, I view COVID as having accelerated tech trends that were already underway, and it just sped up adoption of those trends. So I'll give you some examples. People who hadn't previously shopped online, banked digitally, um, bought their food or groceries online, looked for healthcare solutions online, all of a sudden they mm -hmm. did. All of a sudden, people were staying at home more. People were using their phones and mobile devices more for media and content consumption. So that changed consumer behavior. Um, and so not surprisingly, you saw you know, huge outperformance in certain sectors like gaming, e-commerce, fintech, mm -hmm. digital health. That's just to name a few. But those are some of the sort of immediate beneficiaries of COVID in the past year and a half. Yeah, I, I literally don't carry cash anymore. Like I have, I've been to a bank I think once in 18 months or something crazy. Um, the other thing I don't do is watch TV. <laughs> uh, I just go right to streaming. So I think a big, a huge front and center theme, and this goes right to your wheelhouse, is the convergence of tech and media and sort of where we were five years ago versus where we're going and kind of like how much more consolidation, how much more change can we see in that industry? Yeah, so um, technology has absolutely changed media, but the, the one thing that hasn't changed in the media industry is that content is key. And so two things that I've observed, you know, premium content has never been more valuable, um, but at the same time, we're seeing this powerful emergence of the creator economy, okay? And, and that's because anyone can be a merchant now. Anyone can be a content creator. Anyone can be a content distributor. And consumers also have many more media options, to your point. You know, they have their content library in their pocket at all times, and they can consume media when they want, how they want, um, through whatever device they want. And so I think the traditional media companies and the large cap tech companies and the streaming companies are all trying to figure out how they become the direct -to consumer platform that consumers can't live without. And there's actually two deals that recently announced that I think speak to these or they illustrate these these trends, Alex. So, you know, the Amazon MGM deal, you know, that deal underscores that there's a real scarcity of high quality scaled assets in the media space and how critical depth and breadth of content is in attracting direct to consumer subscribers. And in buying MGM, Amazon bought thousands of hours of movies and TV from decades of content creation and used that to sort of complement and supplement their original content. So that's one example. You know, the other example is the AT&T Warner Media Discovery deal. That deal 
signals that scale and content and this evolving consumption methods will be the key drivers for success in this global direct to consumer, you know, streaming landscape, if you will. And you know, that's a clear case of two high quality players recognizing that if they came together, they'd be better positioned, even though they were already individually very well positioned, they'd be better mm -hmm. positioned to compete and win, you know, on this global playing field. And so I think the headline around around tech and media convergent is Premium content is more valuable than anything, but also there's this powerful emergence of what I'm what I call the creator economy, where really anyone can create content um, and have access to hundreds of millions of people and audience around the world because of these just disruptive tech platforms. So, if we look at say the next you know 12 to 18 months, is the bulk of the activity going to be in these in this tech and media space? Or is it going to be in different kinds of sectors? Do you have a read on that yet as we're coming out of COVID? I, I think that you're seeing with some of these deals, you're seeing um, clear signs of CEO confidence. You're seeing clear signs that CEOs are looking at tech disruption and innovation and ways to innovate their product, their service, their content to get to the consumer in the way that he or she is now consuming content and or engaging on commerce and other you know, technology uh, sectors outside of media. So I think that that's where you'll see most activity. And you know, you know, streaming is in the middle of all of those themes. And so I expect mm -hmm. to see a lot of activity across tech and media convergence, absolutely. Do you have a sense of like what could disrupt that kind of flow right now? Well, listen, you know, the there's a there's a regulatory overlay. There's um, you know how big can these large scale tech platforms get? There's um, you know the ability of independent creators to compete directly with premium content, and you know will broader consumers be interested in both? I believe they will, um, and mm -hmm. so those are the things that I think will impact the evolution of tech and media convergence. Mm -hmm. I do think that for the large cap tech players, they want to own more and more of the customer wallet and mind share is critically important. And the other thing that I think will disrupt the, this evolution is that you know the data and marketing available through content consumption is incredibly valuable across other lines of business, whether you're a tech company or a media company. So that's something I also spend a lot of time thinking about. That's interesting. Um, the, the other part of this world is what's happening in the IPO market, direct listings, SPACs. Everyone I talk to wants to know from you, what do you think the market's going to be for SPACs? Like, how do you see the world of IPOs and SPACs evolving? Um, no one's asked me that before, Alex. Uh, so capital Everyone's market asking me to ask you. So I, know. I, <laughs> I, know. I love it. I love it. But listen, I think, and, and that's, you and I have discussed this, I think capital markets innovation is only a good thing for companies going public, period, full stop. The reasons that companies go public have remained the same, um, but the ways in which they can get public have evolved. And so companies have many more options today than they did five, 10 years ago. They can design how they get public to suit in a bespoke manner that suits their individual needs and desires, objectives and goals. And I think that we at Goldman are fortunate to have leadership position across IPOs, direct listings, SPACs, and I'll get to SPACs in a second. So we're agnostic to the path um, and we can work closely with our clients to help design their public listing path that, as I said, best suits their goals and objectives. And so, you know, the thing I would say, just to put this in a little bit of a historical lens, and I'll get to the SPACs, is, is Direct listings, in my opinion, were arguably the big innovation that kicked off this recent wave of capital markets innovation. And I do think that direct listings will, I don't think that they'll completely replace the IPO. I think that we'll have a healthy mix of both. Um, and, and the reason is that, as I said, people are solving for different needs when they list. And companies that are focused on direct listings, they tend to be less focused on primary capital needs. That's because historically it hasn't been an option. Now it is. They've tended to be less focused on shareholder-based curation and selection, less focused on developing relationships with the research analyst community um, in a more structured and formal way heading into the IPO. The most important thing they're looking for is you know, price transparency. Right? And so those have been the reasons that people um, and companies are biased to direct listings. Now, SPACs, 
um, is, you know, an incredibly hot topic, as, as we've discussed. I actually, I really think that's a real way for companies to get public, and I do believe that SPACs will endure. And, you know, clearly there was this unbelievable surge in SPAC IPOs in the first quarter of this year. There were 300 SPAC IPOs from January to March. Um, that's over five times more SPAC IPOs than in 2019, and significantly more than we saw in 2020. And I'd say the pace we saw in Q1 is probably not sustainable over the long term, which you're already seeing play out. So there were only 30 SPAC IPOs in April and May. And so you can see the market adjusting to a more sustainable pace um, that I think is you know, healthier, you know, longer term for the market. And, I, and the other thing I would say is we're seeing a flight to quality in the SPAC market. I also think that's that's good for the market. It's good for the issuers. You know, people are looking for the highest quality executive leaders, um, the highest quality deal makers, the strongest business networks, strategic relationships, the best operating and sector expertise, and and the strongest investor relationships. And so, the, the SPACs that have that mix of attributes, I think, will do well. And I also think that you'll see more VC and growth equity and private equity SPACs. You know, these are these are great investors who are in the business of looking for the highest quality founders and CEOs and businesses. And that at its core is what a SPAC is and what a SPAC does. Do you feel like there's going to be certain sectors that these kind of VCs and SPACs are going to be targeting? You know, there, there's a mix. There's the you know, generalist backs. There's healthcare focus backs, tech focus backs. You know, as you know, I spend I spend all my time in the technology space, and so that has been an incredibly robust space. I do think there will be a shift um, or a broadening of the SPAC market outside of the U.S. Um, to answer your question with a regional overlay. You know, this has been primarily a U.S. phenomenon, and you know, SPACs are a growing market in Europe. To give you a sense, there's only you know, let's call it a dozen SPACs that are looking for targets uh, in Europe, about half of those actually listed in Europe, and then half of them are U.S. listed looking for European targets. And so that just speaks to the nascency of that market. And I just think given the less crowded nature of the European SPAC market, I think that that represents a growth area um, for SPAC IPOs and in the D-SPAC market. I, I guess my question with that is, you know, if tech fintech um, and all of that is sort of the hot area, it doesn't really feel very Europe to me. Like, they're more old economy. So can the old economy do the new cool finance stuff? I think that, no, I think that there's some great disruptive tech companies um, in Europe. And and I think that there absolutely is, is opportunity for, you know, growth, innovation, disruption across the European tech landscape. Mm-hmm. Um, what have you noticed in terms of how SPACs are evolving? Um, like the Bill Ackman one from last week, when sort of how that was structured. Um, I'm not asking you to comment on that specific one. I'm just saying like the structure and the way that SPACs are being done with the pipe investors versus uh, are getting their cut versus the shareholders in the SPAC. How do you see that changing? Well, so listen, there, that's definitely an, an interesting and unique structure. It's not a traditional SPAC merger, and it's a dynamic situation that's evolving in real time. So it'll be fascinating to see how that plays out. But I think that the broader point we're making is, you know, SPACs are the ultimate example of capital markets innovation. And I think you will see continued innovation, you know, across the market, whether it's IPOs, whether it's direct listings, um, components of the SPAC market. And, and, um, I think, like I said, I think that's only good for investors. I think that a lot of people ask me about, you know, what if you can't find a deal for your SPAC? Like, yeah. what will happen in that scenario? And, you know, as, as I think all of you know, most SPACs have 24 months to find a transaction. In practice, if after that period the SPAC hasn't found a deal, they're supposed to return capital to the shareholders. And, and in reality, I think the answer is time will tell. And what do I mean by that? If you look at the 400-plus SPAC IPOs who are on the hunt for targets, the vast majority of those have only been public for under a year, meaning they're not on the tail end of that two-year period. And so, you know, time will tell, you know, what targets they find and how the investors react to those targets. And investor specs are interesting because, 
investors have a bunch of options to decide whether or not they want to participate and whether or not this SPAC and this merger is actually good for them. You know, they can invest in the SPAC IPO, they can invest in the pipe, they can invest in both. You know, they have the option to redeem their shares if they don't like the deal. And so there's a bunch of options that protect the investor and give them choices along the way to see if that SPAC is the right investment for them. So last question on, on this topic. Do you feel like then the traditional old school IPO where you do your road show and you market it, like, is, is that kind of done now? I, I don't think so. I, I really think that there will be a healthy mix of uh, of deals across IPOs, direct listings, and SPACs. There, there are very concrete reasons why a company would want to do one versus the other. Um, and so I, I, I do believe that there will continue to be traditional IPOs. Will there be a continued evolution and innovation around transparency for issuing clients? Absolutely, yes. But you'll see a healthy mix over time across, I think, those three vehicles to get public. And then the last kind of bucket that you and I spoke about that we wanted to tackle was kind of the old boardroom versus the new boardroom and sort of how those are evolving, but even more importantly from where you sit, how investors and clients want it to evolve that's kind of pushing the change. Yeah, so so um, this is a topic I spend a lot of time on. As, as we've discussed, boardrooms are definitely changing slowly but surely. Um, I think the business case is simple, actually, that diverse boards lead to better governance and stronger performance. That in its essence, is what investors are looking for, stronger performance. Um, and so at Goldman, we're taking this very seriously. You know, first last year, um, in January of 2020, we announced a board diversity initiative where we wouldn't take a company public unless there was at least one diverse board member. This is in, in the U.S. and Western Europe, unless there was one diverse board member. Um, and starting this year in July, the minimum goal is actually two diverse board members, one of whom has to be a woman. And so the, the other uh, thing that I highlight is that we're actually a living example of this commitment. You know, more than 60 percent of our Goldman board is diverse across gender, sexual orientation, race and ethnicity, and that includes our lead director. Uh, we recently added two women to, to our board, and, and I believe we have significantly benefited from having those diverse backgrounds um, in and around the board table and their and their perspectives. And again, the business case for us is quite simple. It leads to better governance and stronger performance. And we're happy to be in a leadership position here. There's obviously a, a, a long way to go on this topic. And so one, one thing that we've done re related to this, Alex, is um, our corporate board engagement team. So, you know, we realized many years ago that our clients were facing the same challenges that we were that we were facing in terms of um, identifying and sourcing diverse board candidates. And so, you know, we realized that we uniquely are in a position to help, you know, match supply and demand, if you will, given all of our relationships across the business community. And we connect people to each other in a bespoke and uh, unique way, given the situation. And so we've now made over 20 board placements in the past year, and that's across all industries. That's pre-IPO, that's public. Um, and we're very encouraged by this early momentum. Like I said, there's still a, a, a very long way to go, but um, hopefully that answers your question, you know, and, and investors absolutely are well, focused on on this. Well, and then, and then to that point, you know, it becomes about not only increasing diversity, but retaining the talent, keeping the talent, promoting the talent, um, and the like, which kind of brings me to my last topic, which is you're clearly in the office. I'm, I'm in the office. And, and all of that, retaining talent, keeping them, helping the junior bankers, helping the newly hired, like all of that. Are people in the office? What's it like? What do you expect going forward? Yeah, so... Um, uh also a topic that, you know, we've, we've been thinking about very carefully for a long time now. And, and the answer to that obviously changes depending on the region you're in and the office you work in. There are, um, you know, parts of our business and our community that are, you know, still heavily impacted by COVID in India, in parts of Europe. And so, you know, the dynamics, you know, vary quite dramatically across region, which you know. Um, right now, I'm at 200 West. I'm in our headquarters, you know, and and it, it does feel different. I've, we believe, given our culture, um, it's an apprenticeship model. It's a teamwork-oriented um, business model. Collaboration is critically important. Communication, and we think it's important for people to be physically together to drive, yeah. you know, 
apprenticeship model. And so, yeah, we've seen, you know, increasing number of people in the office. I think it's great for collaboration. It's great for um, the culture. And um, and so and, it's, and, I mean, and can, very, yeah. What, what about clients? Like, are you traveling to clients want to see you guys not on Zoom? Um, so, so absolutely. Listen, it varies. People have different degrees of comfort and they're in different stages of, you know, their evolution post COVID. But yeah, I would say many clients would, you know, are thrilled to see us and, and I, I'm absolutely, uh, traveling to see clients and, you know, it's, I think it's also created, um, creativity and innovation actually in how we engage with clients. Not surprisingly, a lot of my client meetings have been outdoors over the past year oh. and, and I've had meetings with clients in environments that you'd never, I, I wouldn't have thought of before. Um, and so I think it's created um, sort of an intimacy and a creativity and an engagement with clients that's actually quite compelling.